And welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk, continuing on in our search of Christianity. Uh, we've been doing this now for over seven months, and for that seven months we've looked at the things, what, what Christianity should be, and what we're seeing as all too common. But that's led us, and it's logically led us, to where we are now, to find true Christianity it's drawn us to the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. <clears throat> and in our last program, we, we began an introduction to that. And we're going to continue that in this program. But before we do that, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together in His Word. Oh Lord, we just ask that you open up our eyes so when we read your Word, it will become part of us. Yes. And you open up our ears so when we he, he, hear it, we may it may become part of us too. And open up our heart so it might be absorbed into us, so we may pour it out to others. Amen. 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 So I so said, we just started last week going into where we're headed for that most radical, most wonderful teaching ever, and that's Jesus Christ teaching the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and we, we started last week just kind of going into that, looking at, because not only are we going to follow the teaching of Jesus Christ, we're going to follow the life of Jesus Christ. Because, you know, it says that we have to be hearers of the word, but we have to be doers of the word. And certainly we see the word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. We see that teaching in his life as well as in the, the words that he spoke. And we're to imitate him, so... Absolutely, we are to imitate him. We need to follow him. Yeah. So, in the last program we started, and we looked at the birth of Jesus Christ, Jesus as a young child, and Jesus coming into public ministry when he met with John the Baptist to be baptized publicly and had that approval of God the Father publicly at that point in time. So we're going to pick that up again here. And we'll be looking at the Gospel of Matthew. And that's, you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount may be found both in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke. But, you know, everything that's in the Sermon on the Mount, you'll find the teachings either preceding it from Genesis on through Malachi all the way until the end of the book of Revelation. Okay, everything is summed up in the teaching of Jesus Christ in those three chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 which is eventually where we're going to go and spend our time looking in depth, verse by verse, maybe even word by word at times, okay? So, um, as I said, we, and when we left off last in our last program, Jesus was becoming that public person, all right? And then what happens is the wilderness, yes. okay? The preparation. It says in Matthew 4.1, that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, right off the bat, we need to learn something very, very important. That we get into situations that we don't like, mm -hmm. and we immediately think, uh-oh, you know, this is, where's God in all of this? Well, it was probably God that led you there. Mm -hmm. His promise is to lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He said he would never leave you nor forsake you. But he will often take us some strange places at least strange to our natural man, right? It's very much like the Red Sea. Yes. You know, the Red Sea, if you look at it in the natural, it's probably the most, the biggest predicament that the people of God faced. I mean, here they are, they have been released by the Pharaoh out of that bondage, out of slavery, and, and they wind up at the Red Sea, an impassable, impossible, impossible. barrier, that body of water. <clears throat> Well, you know, it was God that got them free from the Pharaoh. Yes. It was the Lord God Almighty who led them to that Red Sea. Yes. It was the Lord who spoke that Red Sea into existence. Right. Everything about this is, it's the handiwork of God because he has purpose in everything. And as I say, 
He leads us in, you know, he may lead you in places that you weren't expecting. He led Jesus, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, led Jesus into the wilderness. And we always tend to think of the wilderness as kind of, you know, that bad place. A barren, empty place. Barren. Uh, and, I, and I've shared this with you before, you know, that we travel and lived as missionaries. Mark was with us when we lived down in Belize. Mm -hmm. And we lived out in the bush for, for quite some time. That's a wilderness. Mm -hmm. I grew up in New York City in Manhattan. And my dad was in the hotel business. I mean, I grew up in Midtown Manhattan living in hotels. and uh, Everywhere you look, you see the, the work of man. Well, you go into the bush, everywhere you look, you see the, the handiwork of God. That's right. Not the handiwork of... It's, and it's a, a spectacular thing if you are moving and walking in, in the Spirit of God, right? And I've said this before, too. When it came to the Red Sea, God delivered them at the Red Sea. You know, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. He leads us always in triumph in Christ Jesus. That's his plan. When you get into a place that you thought, what am I doing here? What you ought to be doing there is giving thanks in all things and praising God, okay? He's saying, what's in this for you, Lord? What's in this for you, Lord? Because the only difference between a problem and an adventure is your attitude. Amen. And if you have an attitude of praise, if you have an attitude of thanksgiving, all of a sudden your problem becomes that adventure mm -hmm. that, that will bless you and bring glory to God. Hallelujah. So, anyhow... You know the story of Jesus in the wilderness, I, I, I hope. Mm -hmm. You know, God leads him into the wilderness, and the devil shows up to tempt him. And he, he attacks Jesus with his wiles. When Jesus, after 40 days of fasting, got hungry, Satan attacks him and says, you know, just turn that stone into, into bread. Mm -hmm. And Jesus responds with the word. And says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil comes along and says, well, you know, I think he's on a high place and says, if you throw yourself, throw yourself down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's written, God will give you his angels charge concerning you. That's an attack on the pride of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, show, you know, that you're, you're this particular person that you, you, you think you are or you claim to be. And Jesus said, well, it's also written. You should not tempt the Lord your God. Right. It's also written. Because you see, the word of God, or the scriptures, let me put it that way, the scriptures can be mishandled and mismanaged, mm -hmm. even by the devil. That's right. And Paul admonished his son in the faith, Timothy, to rightly divide, divide the word of God. Mm -hmm. The word, the scriptures can be wrongly divided. The word of truth, he said. Mm -hmm. The scriptures can be mishandled and mis used. This is why you need to test everything and make sure that what is spoken is according to the whole word, all right? And then finally, he takes Jesus to this high place and shows him all of the glory, all of the riches of the world. He says, if you bow down to me, you can have all of this. There's a prosperity message for you, hey? Is it not true today that it is still that great temptation of the deceitfulness of riches. Absolutely. Jesus said you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. The thing we need to recognize there is Jesus was victorious in all of this because he stood fast on, proclaimed, and used the one thing that he had to fight the devil, the word of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then... The devil left him, it's written. Matthew 4, 11 says, The devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now sometimes, and a lot of people would kind of uh, teach this, and a lot of, I've heard a lot of people preach this, you know, when you get in trouble, well, the angels are right there. That's not necessarily the case. Not that they may not show up, but God has a sense of timing that is not our sense of timing. All right? The angels showed up to minister to Jesus when it was all over. Right. Uh, you know, is that not true? Yes. Okay, so I just want you to be aware of that. God is always there, 
All right? He'll never leave you nor forsake you. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him till an opportune time. That's what it says in the Gospel of Luke, looking at that same incident. You know what that means? It says, humble yourself, right? Yes. You resist the devil, and he will flee from you. For a while. Mm -hmm. That's right. He'll come back. That's why you have to be persistent in the word of God. And then when, when Jesus now, he, he goes out and it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent for the kingdom of God is hand. So when he comes out of the wilderness, having been tempted by the devil, having been victorious by, with the word of God, yes. now he begins to teach. And what is his message? He begins to preach. What is his message? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. All right, so now we've been following this from the childhood, mm -hmm. right, from the birth to the childhood. We're going to keep on going. So now we're in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Now we're going into the church buildings, mm -hmm. okay? In Luke 4, 14 and 15, it says, And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. So now when he comes out, he goes into the synagogues, okay, which is the, that's the equivalent of our Christian church buildings today. But he doesn't stay there. He goes now, he goes out of the church building and into the highways and byways. In Luke 4, 42 and 44, so we're moving on in that same chapter of Luke, it says, when day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him. And came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also. We're not to be stagnant. <clears throat> it's so easy sometimes just to be, just to get planted where you're comfortable. But the great commission in Matthew 28 was to go into all the world. To go, all right? Then I just want to keep on talking about how he went, in, and this is just examples. It says, he went into Levi's house. That, uh, Levi was the, became the Apostle Matthew, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, 29. Now, you know, the Pharisees, they were comfortable. They want everything to take place in the temple, in the synagogues, mm -hmm. in the buildings that they control. It's not, I don't think they were as offended as Jesus being with the sinners, as Jesus having this ministry that wasn't bound inside their buildings. Because, you know, the, the church, like the God of the church, is not contained in a building. Amen. It says that the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by the hands of man. Acts 17, 24. And it says, it goes on in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote and said, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16. The Lord, watch this now. Mm -hmm. The Lord does not want people to come into the house of the Lord. He wants them to be the house of the Lord. Amen. You know, since the reign of the Emperor Constantine in, in the early 300s, um, it seems that in, the, in Christianity we have made such a focus on the buildings. Yes. Okay? Rather than on Jesus Christ who brings us to the Father. You know, even in the time of Jesus, though, like in Matthew 24, the, the, the apostles came to Jesus as they were leaving the temple and pointed to the temple, you know, and, it's, and when they were going away from there, and they said, they were pointing him out, showing him the glory of the temple. And he said, you know what? Not a stone will be left upon a stone. So he takes his ministry, he takes the word, 
he takes his ministry of reconciliation outside of the buildings for the single most relevant, the single most radical sermon ever preached. Yes. Now, what did he do first? So now we're going to get into the Sermon on the Mount, or shortly in any event. What do you, what do you, logically, what do you think he's done now? We've looked at from, from birth to infancy to manhood to the beginning of his ministry, mm -hmm. into the wilderness, into the synagogues, out into the highways and byways. Where is he going next? That's right, <laughs> to be prepared for what's coming. Okay? The Sermon on the Mount, like I just said, is the most radical, the most fantastic sermon teaching ever preached. Teached. That's not a word. But what did he do to get ready for it? He spent what? the night in prayer. He spent the night in prayer. You know, years ago, um, Alice and I were ministering. We were out in California. We were out in Southern California. And we were staying at her brother's house, who lives in Orange County, uh, in California. And it just so happens, I may have shared this with you, you may have heard me share this before, but there was a flu epidemic, literally a flu epidemic going on in Southern California that was so bad that there was no over-the-counter medicine anywhere in Orange County. Yeah. And it, it was it just... Headlines in the news. Oh, news. absolutely, it was headlines. I mean, it was an absolute epidemic, a flu epidemic. I don't remember what year this was. It's got to be in the early 90s, I imagine. And uh, we were, as I say, we were staying with her brother. It sounded like a ward. I mean, everybody just in that house was just hacking and coughing, except we were not. Yeah. We left that house because we were scheduled, and I, we drove up to uh, Modesto, California, a couple of hundred, to maybe 250 miles farther north, where I was supposed to preach in a church in Modesto. Mm -hmm. And we got there, and we went to the pastor's house. We were staying with him overnight before I, I preached. And we got there, and we had some fellowship. It was lovely. We had dinner. We had fellowship. And we went to bed. And as soon as I got in that bed, bam, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, all of a sudden, I was sweating. I was coughing. I had I mean, it was just cold. And I decided, well, I'm not going to just lay here and be sick. So I got up, and I went into the living room. And I spent the night in that living room in prayer. That's what that's what I did. Well, that night, that time of prayer, I'm sure that the devil wanted to knock me out. But what happened was I spent the entire night getting prayed up. Yes. And by the way, by the morning time, you were I, I was I was more than well, yes. <laughs> and I was excited yes, you were. because of what God had given me during that night. You had supernatural strength. As, and as a matter of fact, I went and I preached, you know, I, what I preached was what I heard, and that was a sermon that's called The Attitude of the Righteous. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that's when God gave it. Mm -hmm. That's a sermon that I have now preached on five continents. Uh, so, you know, it's, oh, it says in Genesis 50, 20, what, what the devil means for evil, God meant for good, right? Yes. So he turned that around. It's in Isaiah 8.10, it says, devise a plan. Talking to the enemy, devise a plan, but it'll be thwarted. Mm -hmm. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Mm -hmm. So you just have to stand fast and believe. It's because it says, you know, we know, God works all things together for good. Romans 8.28. Yes. So in Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount, in Luke chapter 6, he starts by saying this. It was at this time that he, Jesus, went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. What do you think he was, what do you think he was doing? Well, he was being obedient to the word that he is. Because J James would say later on, This you know, my beloved brethren. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. What he was doing was being quick to hear and slow to speak. Because faith comes by hearing. Prayer is not talking to God. Prayer is talking with God. It's conversation with the Lord. Because here's what Jesus said, you know, and it's in John chapter 12. He said, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me 
has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father told me. The Sermon on the Mount came from a night in prayer. Thank you, Lord. You need to know that what you, what you need to hear and speak has to come out of, out of prayer, out of a conversation with the Lord. I think it's unfortunate, and again, this is about a search for Christianity, that uh, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to say this without sounding judgmental or upset. I don't, well, I'll just say just it. Say it. <laughs> If you went on Google and did a search mm. for sermons for sale, mm. which I did today, by the way, did just to see, it came up with a million sites or a million hits, just like that, in, in you know less than a second. Because so many pastors, in, they go out and they purchase the sermons, mm -hmm. you know, and they download the sermon and then they just go into the service on Sunday and just they kind of read it up, yes. So when, when Jesus calls bond servants and then tells them to count the cost, that's what you said in Luke 14, right? Well, now you know. You can buy a sermon for about four ninety five online and save hours of prayer. That's the cost. Listen to the voice of the Lord. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. It'll keep you out of trouble, okay? Do everything. Prepare for everything with prayer. Now I want to talk about the audience of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? If you've ever seen any pictures, any movies, anything where they show the Sermon on the Mount, it's always the same. There's Jesus standing on the hill with billions of people, thousands and thousands of people all around him. That may look good in the movies and it may film well, but it's not what happened. It is absolutely not what happened. What happened was, well, you know... He sat down and he taught his disciples. Yes. Okay. The first thing that happens is he chooses the apostles from among the disciples who were there. Mm -hmm. Luke 6.13. When they came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them who he also named as apostles. So now we're looking at, here's, here's kind of three groups of people that are there. There, there. there are the apostles, there are the disciples, and then there are the throngs, the crowds. Okay? Yes. <clears throat> he was teaching the disciples. The crowd was allowed to listen in. It says in Matthew 5, now this is where the Sermon on the Mount starts, Matthew 5, reading verses 1 and 2, it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Okay? It was common practice for somebody teaching to sit, okay? But you see, it specifically says that he is teaching his disciples. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote to his son Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, and he says, All scripture is God-breathed and profitable. Well, if you look at that, and we'll see the last thing that it's profitable for is training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. These disciples, remember, the last thing he, we saw, he's out there and he calls people to repentance. Yes. All right, so people are being saved. They're accepting yes. that message. They're those, repenting. Those who have repented. And this is where the disciples are coming from. Now these are all new disciples. They have to be trained in righteousness. When you are saved, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you come out of that death and into new life, when, like Lazarus came out of that tomb, mm. trust me, you're still a baby. That's right. You don't know it all. No matter how well you knew the scriptures ahead of before that. You may have known. Some people didn't. I didn't know the scriptures at all when I got saved. You may have known scriptures. But the simple fact of the matter is, at that point, you need to be trained in righteousness. So before Jesus is going to send out the apostles, before Jesus is going to send the disciples out to do anything, he is going to train them in righteousness. All right, so now... Just for your information, it says in, in, in Luke 7, at the, at the end of it, it says, when he had completed his, all his discourse in the hearing of the people, that's talking about something else, but he's talking in the hearing of the people. 
-hmm. Here in Matthew, in, in Matthew 7, it says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus had finished these words, when he finished giving the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Matthew 7, 28 and 29. You see, the crowds that were there were amazed. But not the apostles, not the disciples. That's because they recognized his authority from the beginning of it. Yes, that's why they followed him. Right. The crowds didn't recognize his authority mm -hmm. until they heard him. And now, now they're astounded by his, that he spoke with authority. Mm -hmm. Okay? After telling his disciples the all-important parable of the sower and the seed, it says, as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. Mark 4. So, you know, the people don't understand what's going on, all right? But the disciples do. We did, a, we did a, one of the programs not long ago, a few weeks ago, on, on discipleship, and then the following yes, one was on understanding. understanding yes. But then it goes on in Luke chapter 6 and says, And turning his gaze towards his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor. He begins to talk to them, mm -hmm. because disciples get understanding. Now realize this. The Word of God is, first of all, to the saved. Yes. God speaks to the saved with the word, obviously. Because, as this is what I said before, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The word of God well, it was the seed that brought us to eternal life. But once you're saved, now that word is there for you to equip you for every good work, to train you in righteousness. To, to re teach you, to reprove you, when, or you know, to correct you when you need correction. Mm -hmm. But the Word of God is also to the unsaved, because it says in, in 2 Timothy 3, before that, the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, yeah. So, isn't that what it says? I mean, you know, the Word of the Cross is the power of God unto salvation, right? Yes. So, the word is for the unsaved to bring them to salvation. Mm -hmm. The word is for the saved to bring them to that maturity in righteousness. Yes. So now where are we? It says in Matthew 5, verse 2, He opened his mouth and began to teach them. Mm -hmm. So now this is where we're going to go. We are going to go through the Sermon on the Mount, line by line. All through this, and we're going to go into this in detail, Jesus is saying, you know, he said, you, you've heard it said, but I say to you. He is overcoming what they have been trained and taught in religion. Yes. Because he is taking them from religion to relationship. He is taking them for rich, from rituals into righteousness. And this is where we need to go to live true Christianity today. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We especially, above all, thank you for your word who was made flesh, who stood and came to us, Lord, willingly. Your son, Jesus Christ, who brought this message on that mount, Lord, telling us how we should be living, what true Christianity is. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. God bless you. Until next time. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners.